Gravedigger, A Day Brandstetter Mystery, Book 6, Author, Joseph Hansen, Publisher, Open Road Integrated Media, New York. Narrator, Eric Ost. Chapter 5. The Triumph jolted over the hump from Horseshoe Canyon Trail and dropped sharply down into the brick-paved yard of his house. Only the headlamps lighted the yard. Amanda had installed ground spots in the shrubbery, but... The rains of February had brought rushing mudslides down from the hills behind the place. Mud two feet deep had uprooted the lights and swept them off down the canyon with other debris. Brush trees, automobiles, parts of houses. David got off lightly. Warped floors, waterlogged furniture, soaked and swollen books, and the ground lights. He'd ordered replacements, but the contractor's waiting list was long. The lights of the Triumph jittered, reflected in the square panes of the French doors and they crossed the front of the building, and they also showed him a vehicle he did not know. A new custom van, glossily painted with rearward streaking flames. He wheeled the Triumph in beside it, checked his watch. It was 4.40 in the morning, shut off the engine, and climbed wearily out of the car. Who did he have to meet now? He wanted to sleep. The van's license frame named a Sacramento dealer with the pin light. Dave probed inside the van through the windows. Nothing showed who owned it. A new road map lay on the seat. He switched off the pin light, dropped it into the pocket of the sheepskin coat, and walked around the end of the building into the brick center court, where a big old live oak loomed up blacker than the surrounding blackness. A wooden bench had been built around the thick trunk of the tree. Plants stood on most of the bench, but there was space to sit down. The brickwork on which the bench was footed was uneven, and the props of the bench clunked when it was set on, or stood up from. The props clunked now. Dave halted and groped for the pen light again. I guess you don't need me, a voice said. Not staying out till practically sunrise. You've been in some warm bed, and it wasn't mine. Dave found the pinlight and poked its narrow beam at the sound of the voice. The beam showed him a tall, skinny young black in a leather cap corduroy car coat with wooden peg fastenings, driving gloves. His name was Cecil Harris, and he stood with shoulders hunched, looking cold. His eyes were large in his thin face, and they expressed reproach. Dave said, I haven't been in a warm bed. I've been working. You know the kind of hours I have to keep. He put away the light, crossed the uneven bricks, took the boy in his arms and kissed him. They stood holding each other tight. It's good to see you. How'd you ever find me? If you were on the moon, the boy said, I'd find you. You know that. Don't you know that? I know it now. In Dave's arms, the boy shivered. Let's get you inside. How long have you been waiting? Why didn't you telephone? I wanted to surprise you, Cecil chuckled. Through the teeth were chattering. You know me and surprises. Yeah, the last time, Dave took his arm and walked him away from the tree. You're also waiting in the dark in my motel room at La Calita. I thought you were a mugger. Nearly broke your arm with a wine bottle. Only that time you were naked. Cecil shuddered audibly. No way am I going to get naked in this weather. Not out here. Dave unlocked a door. Not to the front building the one with the row of French windows, to a back building. This property was odd. Two stables, it may have been once. Each a single enormous room, and over yonder, a cook shack. Amanda had redesigned them all, building here a roomy loft for sleeping. Unfinished pine to match the original walls. Dave reached inside for a switch that lit a pair of lamps. The big room was chilly and still held a faint smell of damp and mud. Dave crouched to light with a gas pilot jet, kindling and logs in a wide-used brick fireplace. Another of Amanda's improvements. When he rose, Cecil had not moved from inside the door. Dave said, You're old enough so your brother couldn't stop you coming to me, so that means you're old enough for a drink. Brandy is warming. Would you like some brandy? Pulling off the driving gloves, Cecil came to the fireplace. He held his hands out to the logs that 
as yet or doing less flaming than smoking. I was thinking, he said, of another way to get warm. It's in the Boy Scout manual, you know. Rub two bodies together till you get a spark. He raised his eyes to the shadowed loft under its canted rafters. That's where the bed is. It won't go away, Dave said. I need a brandy. If you don't, it will make everything go better. No way. We could go better, Cecil said. We go the very best. I never forgot. I think about it every day. Every night? Especially every night. I thought those 18 months would never go by. A couch pine frame. Corduroy cushions faced the fireplace. He dropped lankily onto it. I went to your old digs on Robertston, above the art gallery. This is strange, but that was stranger. You know how strange it was? All those big, empty rooms. Emptier than you think, Dave said. Christian was there, looking like he just barbecued Captain Cook. He wanted me out of my bulky winter clothes and into his hammock under the banyan tree. Where was Doug, Dave said. He meant Doug Sawyer, with whom he had lived for a few years before the advent of Christian. Doug was a painter, but made his living from the gallery he owned. Christian ran a Polynesian restaurant across the street, the bamboo raft. Luckily, he came up the stairs before my virtue got violated. That is one big tropical fruit. That Christian and Doug, he told me about this place. It took some finding. Hey, thank you, David put into his long fingers a glass globe with two inches of corvisor in the bottom. The firelight glinted red in the brandy. Cecil studied it. Pretty, he said, and tasted it. Woo-hoo, he grinned up at Dave. I see what you mean. What have you been doing? Dave dropped onto the couch beside him, tasted his own brandy, lit a cigarette. You got into television, right? When David met him, Cecil was a trainee from a local college getting on the job experience at a mountaintop station above a small city up the coast. That's a nifty van. The pay must be good. Not in back of the camera, Cecil said. Up Sacramento way, I wanted to come here. But you know, my big brother, the jailer who thinks gayness is something you don't grow, shit. If I grow any more, the basketball scouts won't leave me alone. No, the paper behind the camera, typing up your tapes of highway commission meetings, is not like the pay for looking pretty and mispronouncing words in front of the camera. No, I was gifted with some bread on my 21st birthday. That is how I come to have the van. I bought it yesterday. He checked a new watch, studded with stops on his lean wrist. Uh, excuse me, uh, day before yesterday. Happy birthday, Dave kissed his neat little ear. And I drove it straight to you. Well, maybe straight is not the word I want. Maybe I mean I drove it gaily to you. All right, he laughed, sipped his brandy, grew solemn. His eyes were big and reproachful again. Shit, I was scared when you didn't come. You don't know all the thoughts I had out under that tree. I was colder inside than I was outside. What if you forgot all about me? What if you didn't care anymore? You didn't write, Dave said. I wrote, Cecil said. I just never mailed what I wrote. It wasn't what you'd call decent, you know? I was writing with my cock. What good would that do you? What good did it do me? Dave snubbed out his cigarette. He stood and shed the sheepskin coat. It will be warm up at the loft now, he said. He picked up his glass cigarettes, lighter, went into the shadows for the brandy bottle, went to the foot of the stairs. You want to see how warm it is? Cecil unfolded his long bones from the couch, tossed the leather cap on the couch, dropped his car coat there. He came to Dave. You could put it like that, he said. The Juilliard School of Music had not Lyle Westover seen since nearly a year. That was how the young woman with the German accent who answered the telephone there put it. She was a student. It was not her job answering this telephone. She had answered it because the office staff had left for the day. 
but she did know Lyle, and he had not last fall returned to Juilliard, his classes to resume. She did not know whether he was with friends in New York, staying, but she could not name of his friends. Give to strangers on the telephone. She did remember that he had a student instructorship being awarded for last summer at Buenos Ventos. That was in California. She hoped nothing bad to Lyle had happened. If he shows up, Dave said, will you let me know, please? He gave her his number, thanked her, hung the yellow receiver of the cook shack phone back in its place on the end board of a knotty pine cupboard. Cornbread was baking in the oven of the stately old steel and porcelain country kitchen stove. Amanda had had refitted to run on gas. Heat leaked from the oven and made the cook shack pleasantly warm. He glanced out the window. Cecil came out of the rear building in a starchy new white robe with deep kimono sleeves. He was scrubbing his hair with a big white bath towel. He stepped from the shadow of the live oak into sunlight, turned his face up to the sun, blinking, feeling for warmth. Dave felt a sweet ache in his chest and turned away. It had been a long time since he had reacted to anyone this way. It was dangerous. Too many years separated them. Decades. He was being a fool. He filled two yellow mugs with coffee and set them steaming on the country kitchen table. Amanda had found in some junk shop and stripped down to its original yellow pine. There were country kitchen chairs to match. The works of the refrigerator were new, but concealed in a gigantic old oak icebox of many doors. Thank God it's warm someplace, Cecil came in and shut the door. This is Southern California, man. It's supposed to be deserts. Keep on like this, I will turn into a licorice popsicle. He hung the towel over a chair back and sat down. Uh, hot coffee. He took the mug in both hands. Did you get New York? Something sure smells good. Cornbread, Dave said. If you want to phone New York, you don't wait until 2.30 in the afternoon. Pacific Standard Time, you get out of bed like ordinary people. I liked it in bed, Cecil said. So did I, Dave said. The grill was ready. The eggs were beaten. The jack cheese was shredded. The avocado cut up. He made omelets. I got somebody on the phone. I don't think Lyle is in New York. He bit and got the cornbread out of the oven. He lifted a corner of an omelet with a spatula. It was golden brown on the bottom. He folded both omelets, burning his fingers. He cut generous slabs of the cornbread and lit thick pats of butter melt into them. He laid them in a basket with a yellow napkin over them and set the basket on the table. He slid the omelets onto plates, set the plates on the table. To give you back your strength, he sat down across from Cecil. Salt, pepper. Look at that, Cecil said and poked at the omelet with his fork. What is in there, man? Avocado, Dave said. Cheese. Oh, wow, Cecil took a mouthful. His eyes widened. He opened his mouth and panted. Hot, he gasped. He wouldn't like it cold, Dave said. He pushed the basket of cornbread at him. Do you want to play detective with me today or have you things to do? The only thing I have to do is you, Cecil said. Forever, from now on, all right? All right. Dave smiled. Uh, but I won't hold you to it. Hold me, Cecil said. Any way you want, only the last time I played detective with you, you nearly got killed. That big dude with the beard on the smuggling boat? There's no way you can take the blame for that, Dave said. That was my own mistake. I shouldn't have left you by yourself, Cecil said. I won't ever leave you by yourself again. This is better cornbread than Mama used to make. Ground the dried corn by herself, did she? Dave said. Down on the old plantation? Up in old Detroit, Cecil said. Got it out of a ready-mix box from the supermarket. You had milk and an egg. No, she didn't have time to cook much. Always working. Working till it killed her to turn my holy brother into a dentist to buy me that van when I got to be 21. 
What kind of case are you working on that kept you out till five in the morning? Dave told him. By the time he had finished, the plates were empty. The bread basket was empty. They were drinking second mugs of coffee and smoking cigarettes. Dave took from a pocket of his blue wool shirt a flimsy pink form, rumpled a carbon copy, smudged. He unfolded it and pushed it across the table into Cecil. That was what I found. Not in the files, on the desk. Westover rented a truck. If I'm right, on the very day he disappeared. If he took his Rolls Royce, the cigarette hung in a corner of Cecil's mouth, tough detective style. He narrowed his eyes against the smoke while he read the form and he used a Bogart voice. What did he want with the truck? Get dressed, Dave said, and we'll try to find out. Cecil got up. Come with me while I dress. If I did, we'd never get out of here, Dave said. The man behind the counter was a woman, old and gray. The lines of the nonsense rhyme jumped into his mind, and he had to suppress a grin in the storefront office of Momentum Truck Rentals in Santa Monica, where the walls were wood grain plastic and the plants that hung in baskets or crocheted in corners were plastic. The woman in charge was a caricature little old lady, frail, in a double-knit lavender pants suit, stiff as cardboard. And he had no right to grin. He was gray himself, and if not as old as she was, still old. Cecil was making him forget that, making him remember that silly verse from his childhood. He showed the woman the pink flimsy. He didn't bring it back. She piped, she quivered. You mean he owned you money on it? I mean he abandoned it, she said. If you read this, she tapped the flimsy with a bony finger, you'll see he said he was going to return it the next day. Well, he didn't return it the next day. He never returned it, just climbed out of it and left it. Uh, you know that, Dave said. How do you know that? Because we notified the police. Sheriff, Highway Patrol, a prowl car spotted it, notified us, and we had it back here at noon the following day. Did he come in alone? Dave said. Were you on duty? He had a boy with him. The twang of guitars crashed from a loudspeaker in a corner over a pair of chairs and a plastic veneer table. She looked up at the speaker. She trembled back to a wood grain plastic door yanked it open and shrilled into a room where a long-haired youth in a ten-gallon hat sat with his feet on a desk, munching a hamburger. Turn that racket down. I have people out here. She slammed the door and came back. The guitars faded to a whisper. Skinny, curly-headed boy, she went on, as if nothing had happened. Man's son, I guess, looked like him a little. Had something wrong with him couldn't talk right. Why did he talk at all? Dave said. I don't think he wanted the man to rent the truck, she said. Hard to understand a mouthful of marbles. I did catch one thing, though. Says, if you do this, you're no better than Arnold O'Rourke. The reason I remember the name, my first husband was an O'Rourke. Dead now, she frowned, folded the pink slip, handed it back to Dave. No, the boy was angry, nervous. While I made up the papers, he kept walking out like he was going to leave. Just have nothing to do with it, but he always came back in after a minute. Did Westover pay in cash, Dave asked. Most people use credit cards, she said. But he had cash. Did you notice what kind of car he came here in? Couldn't help it, could I, she said. Rolls-Royce Vintage. Now you see your share of roses, especially if you drive through Beverly Hills. Which I do, coming into work every day from the valley. But they don't often show up here. People like that don't rent trucks. They get their furniture hauled by moving companies. Did he say he was moving? Dave asked. He didn't say what he was doing, she said. It's none of my business. I wondered, of course... I guess I wondered out loud, but he didn't say. 
not that I remember. He made the boy drive the truck. He followed in the rolls. Why did they abandon the truck? Dave said. She turned to her computer keyboard and punched up the information. It came in cross-stitched letters on a television screen encased in grubby white plastic. El Segundo? She read off a street address. She smiled at Cecil. She had pearly little false teeth. What are you so happy about? I swear you're grinning all over yourself. Just married, Cecil said and bent double and spun around laughing. When he recovered himself, she made him a present. A tiny toy truck with momentum printed on its side. The address was off the San Diego freeway in an area of lonely warehouses, abandoned rows of shops, weedy vacant lots strewn with automobile carcasses. Now and then an oil pump cast a nodding shadow in the long late afternoon winter sunlight. Where people lived existed were clutches of shacks, broken windowed porches falling off roof gaps showing fish bones of gray rafter, black children in gaudy rags, ran the cracked sidewalks, sick old black people hobbled, sick dogs dodged and slunk in patches of shade among the rotting cars, tattered men sprawled, snoring open-mouthed, clutching empty wine bottles. Soweto, Cecil said. You can't see this from the highway, Dave said. They landscape that, don't they? Cecil said. Shit. You're driving through the real America and you don't even know it. Green ground cover, flowering bushes, lacy trees. Fucking paradise. Here's the street. He steered the van away from the shacks. The blacks. Not a sound here. Grass sprouting through the asphalt. Bleak storage buildings. Some of them cinder block. The paint of sign lettering. Flaking. Fading. Some of them corrugated iron. The bolts. Weeping rust. It was one of these he stopped at. This is it. They climbed down out of the van. Shadows of goals flickered over them. In the distance, a ship's whistle sounded hoarsely. Again, they stared at the building and at a loading dock. And broad doors hung by wheels to a rusty rail. No one had used the loading dock or the doors in a very long time. Seasons of bramble crops had grown and withered in front of the dock. They crackled through the dead brambles and climbed plank stairs. At the far end of the doors was a window. They went to it and tried to see inside. The window was crusted with salt from the sea air. Dave spat on his fingers and rubbed some of the crust away. He put his face to the glass. Cobwebs that had trapped only dust were thick on the inside of the window. He wasn't sure what he saw, but it looked like emptiness. We could break it, Cecil said. Nobody would know. Dave went to examine the place where the doors came together. Hasps held, padlocks corroded. One at waist level, one at shoe top level. Tire iron, he asked. Cecil? Cecil fetched a brand new tire iron. Dave pried the hasp loose on the top lock. Cecil wedged the iron under the other hasp, yanked, and it came loose too. Dave gripped the edge of the right-hand door and pulled. There were rusty squeaks up on the roller rail, but the door didn't budge. Cecil took hold of the door with him, and they hauled at it together. It didn't yield. I'm going to smash out that window, Cecil said. I think I saw a door along the side, Dave said. They trudged through weeds. Last year's tall, brown, brittle. This year's short, feebly green. Trash in the weeds. Beer cans. Dusty wine bottles. Between this building and the next. The passageway was cold, as if the sun never reached it. Dave climbed plank steps to a rickety stoop that trembled under him. The door was thin, an ordinary room door. Old. He tried the gritty knob. The door was locked. He stepped back and aimed a kick with his heel, just below the knob. The door didn't fly open. Instead, one of its panels fell off with a clatter that echoed. He knelt. Don't go in there, Cecil said. Let me do that. Dave poked his head inside. The light was poor, but there was enough to show him the place was empty. He withdrew his head. 
Never mind, he said. He got to his feet and descended the steps, brushing dirt off his hands, off the knees of his pipe stem corduroys. There's nothing in there, not even a broken crate. What did they bring that truck here for? Cecil said. Dave headed for the sun down street. Cecil followed, and Dave said, Lyle can tell us. He said you don't know where he is. Dave opened the van door. I've changed my mind, he said. Tomorrow, we'll go ask him. Cecil slouched in a deep chair alone in a far corner of the room and watched the news on television. At this end of the room, where laughter, the tinkle of ice and glasses, the munching of dim sum, Amanda and Miles, Edwards had brought the food, warm in foil, and had unwrapped it in the cook shack. It was being consumed in the long front building of Day's Place, which Amanda had made interesting by raising and lowering floor levels, expanding the fireplace, and adding clerestory windows so daylight could get in. Because Dave refused to cut the trees that surrounded the place, it was past seven. A yellow lamplight bloomed softly in the room. There were bays of velvety shadow, and the trees couldn't be seen now through their French windows. What could be seen reflected in these small square panes were strangers who belonged to Edwards and Amanda. Young, fair faces, middle-aged, glossy faces, vaguely familiar from television shows that depended for laughs or on pratfalls and odd costumes, and friends who belonged to Dave, Mel, and Makato. Ray Lallard, plump and matronly, a telephone company executive who sometimes helped Dave out with numbers hard to get, had brought Kovacs in clay-stained work clothes and two days' beard stubble. Kovacs was a potter who had set up shop in a stable back of Lollard's expensively restored 1890s mansion on West Adams, and who seemed to make Lollard happy. A lean, dark, intense man talked with Amanda. He was Tom Owens, an architect, and David narrowly saved from being murdered a few years back. Doug Sawyer, neat and slight, chatted with a pair of young actors, happily. Christian hadn't come. Madge Dunstan stood with Dave. Bony freckled, her honest laughter showing long, horsey teeth. She was a very old friend, a successful designer of fabrics and wallpapers. An unsuccessful lover of beautiful young women whom she never could hold on up to for long. Tonight was tall, blonde, boyish, famous from television commercials for a shampoo. Dave hadn't caught her name, nor was he listening to her while she talked at him. He was pretending to listen. He was watching the back of Cecil's skull, which he could just see above the chair back, far away in shadow. The TV tube, a bright kaleidoscope beyond him, he wondered if Cecil was sulky. And if so, why? He had been merry fifteen, twenty minutes ago, enjoying everybody, everybody enjoying him. He had spent some minutes by the fireplace talking to Edwards. Dave had been occupied with mixing and handing out drinks and hadn't paid attention, but he remembered that they hadn't smiled, that they'd seemed earnest. Now Edwards was laughing, arm around Amanda, who was laughing with him. They looked fine together, handsome, happy, young. He wasn't worried about Amanda anymore, but he didn't understand Cecil. Yes, television news enchanted him. Before he had met Dave, he wanted to be part of it. Dave went down two waxed pine steps, crossed Navajo rugs, went up pine steps. A glass hung in Cecil's long fingers. But he hadn't touched the drink in it. On the television screen was filmed from a handheld camera that bobbed, panning the stumbling progress of a young man in yellow coveralls, handcuffs, chains on his ankles, being led past a gray wall by uniformed officers. His hair was long and yellow and needed combing. He had a tangled yellow beard and blue eyes that glared savagely at the camera lenses. Dave sat down in the chair beside Cecil, took the drink from his hand, sipped at it, and bent forward to hear the voice of the talking head that had replaced the jittery film. The sound was low. It was released by Tucson authorities late this afternoon when his real identity was established. Dave switched off the set. 
Cecil looked at him as if, only now realizing he was there, he said, They thought they had Azrael for sure. Looks just like him. Wrong man, he shivered. Those eyes, though, this one's got to be crazy, too. There are different kinds of crazy, Dave said. Happily, most of them don't murder girls and bury them in the backyard. This one's never even heard of Azrael. Cecil shook his head in wonder and disgust. He never sees the news, never reads. He watches the clouds and the birds, the little streams rippling over the pretty rocks, right? He listens to the wind and the trees and watches the sunrise. They'll get him for that eventually, Dave said. He handed Cecil back his glass. Are you all right? I can't go with you tomorrow, Cecil didn't look at him. He talked to the blank television screen. I've got an appointment for a job. He took a quick gulp of whiskey. Dave blinked and felt bleak. When did all this happen? You're going to work with me. You were never going to leave me by myself again. Isn't that what you said? This is pretty sudden, isn't it? Uh, what do you need with a job? You don't want a kept boy, Cecil said. Will you look at me, please? What the hell are you talking about? You'll earn your keep. Cecil shook his head impatiently. You don't need my help. You don't need anybody's help. Got along fine on your own all this time. Kept boy, that's what I'd be, he jerked his head to indicate the laughing people at the other end of the room. He pitched his voice up, pursed his mouth, fluttered his lashes. What do you do, young Cecil? Do you act? Do you interior decorate? Do you style women's hair? He changed voices. No, ma'am. I just sleeps with Mesta Blanstata. Edwards puts this idea into your head, Dave said. He just figured I'd be wanting the job, and he's fixing it for me. A good job. Field reporter. On a camera. You didn't want that anymore, Dave said. It will keep me honest, Cecil was big-eyed, imploring. It won't change anything between us. Just, I can't be with you all the time. Don't they say that's best? I don't know who they are, Dave said. But... Edwards is an interfering bastard. He stood up, turned, and Edward was watching from across the room. Dave couldn't read his expression. Not smug. What the hell was it? Anxious? Cecil tugged Dave's wrist. Don't spoil it. It will be a good job. The pay will be great. It'll make me feel righteous. Like I was somebody fit for you to love. You were that before, Dave said. If you care how I feel, Cecil said. You will sit down. If all you care about is knocking Edwards upside his head, go on. Dave sat down. I care how you feel, he grumbled. I couldn't just live off you, Cecil said gently. You know that wouldn't be right. I wish they'd go the hell home, Dave said. So I could get you in bed and talk some sense into you. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold, to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides, and in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew, reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.